Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the second lecture in my series on the pathology of small ruminants. And we're going to cover two systems today, the hematolymphatic system and the endocrine system. Before I do that, I want to thank these outstanding individuals who've been kind enough to share their knowledge and their images with me over the years. Let's start with the hematolymphatic system, and we're primarily going to focus on the lymph nodes. First disease we need to talk about affects both sheep and goats, and is known as caseous lymphadenitis. It tells you a lot about the disease, lymphadenitis, and that it affects primarily the lymph nodes, but we'll see that it can go systemic as well. And caseous describes the appearance of these lymph nodes. Caseous meaning cheesy. And over time, the infection of the lymph nodes will result in sheep in alternating rings of suppurative inflammation and fibrosis, which gives it an onion-like appearance. And the way this happens is essentially that the agent gets into the lymph node and results in profound suppurative inflammation. Well, the body's going to try and wall this off. And so it will put a ring of fibrous connective tissue, but this is an extremely hardy agent which survives well both in the body and within the environment. So eventually it's going to break through and it's going to do the same thing again outside of that ring of, of fibrous connective tissue in the lymph node. And then the body says, oh, no, you don't, and puts down another ring. And this happens um, alternating uh, over time between separation and fibrosis. And so in the affected sheep, uh, over time, the lymph nodes have this lamellated appearance. This does not happen um, to this extent in goats. It tends to be much more of a just straight liquefactive appearance. And that... That difference was first noted by Dr. Corey Brown, who did her PhD on this disease uh, and was the first person to uh, put that idea out there and in writing. So kudos to you, Dr. Brown, for that little tidbit, which I've used so many times over the years and for doing so much more for our field. Let me show you one more beautiful picture of one of these lymph nodes from a sheep. Now, this is a disease that uh, does not affect just sheep and goats. You can see it in a number of other species, including horses, where it causes a form of ulcerative, lymph ulcerative lymphangitis, which starts by infecting wounds and moves up the, uh, uh, up the affected lymphatics, eventually getting into the muscles of the chest, where it causes a lot of swelling any condition known as pigeon breast. It's also seen in a number of wild ruminant species and water buffaloes as well. <clears throat> now it generally starts off as a cutaneous abscess and you'll find that uh, uh, a number of animals in a herd will have these cutaneous abscesses. These, this has been opened up to show the extent of the separation. Now this will occasionally be spread throughout the, the herd during the time when the animals are sheared and dipped. If you've ever seen a, a shearing of sheep, it's a fairly rapid and, and I don't want to say brutal, but uh, there are a fair number of little nicks and cuts from the shearing uh, tools um, that happen in the uh, in the skin of these animals. Now that is also a great place to get the agent, but what happens is they have these abscesses and they accidentally lance these abscesses, they take the wool off, and then the next thing that they do is they run the sheep through a dip fat to get rid of external parasites. And as we said before, this is an extremely hardy bacterium. It gets into the the uh, dip fat and it contaminates the solution and then the next sheep comes by wasn't infected but has all these little nicks and cuts all over its body and now it's infected and then the next one and then the next one and all of a sudden you have a lot of animals that are infected it generally takes several weeks to months to form one of these abscesses so it's not a a quick um <clears throat> it's not a 
quickly growing disease, but a great way to spread it. Now, the, the biggest problem with uh, caseous lymphadenitis is the fact that about 20% of the affected animals of the bacterium will go systemic. And then it likes to concentrate on the lymph nodes within the body. Uh, so it can go to any of the lymph nodes in the body. If it goes to the hyalur lymph nodes, and you know how these lymph nodes are gonna get bigger and bigger and harder. And that is one place where actually if it gets that big, the animals can asphyxiate and have, by uh, having trouble breathing. Um, you can also have dispersion of this particular agent through the viscera. And if you go back into the Wednesday slide conferences, we've had a number of cases over the years where we've had it in the liver and in the kidney and other visceral organs. So that is the story of caseous lymphadenitis, carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis, and especially uh, important disease in sheep and goats, but seen in other species as well. Now here's the lymph node of a goat with a little different look. It's sort of yellowish. It's sort of dry and crumbly. Uh, we said before that in goats, Carinobacterium pseudotuberculosis tends to be a little more liquefactive, a little ooey, gooey type of messy thing. And this is, this is a bit more uh, uh, on the dry and crumbly side. And the fact that it is yellow and it's a ruminant and it's dry makes you want to think of mycobacterium, the traditional uh, mycobacteria that cause uh, real tuberculosis. You can see a very similar appearance in uh, cattle, which don't show a whole lot of signs most of the time with mycobacterium tuberculosis. But the disease is a little bit different in, uh, in goats. There is a particular species of uh, tuberculosis that affects goats. This is Mycobacterium capri. It's a cluster within the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, um, which primarily affects goats. It is a zoonotic disease, and it is primarily seen in uh, Central uh, to Eastern Europe. It's never actually been seen outside of uh, continental Europe. So, but it does tend to uh, uh, to spread much more quickly uh, within goats. You tend to have much more significant lesions. In some countries, like Spain, it may represent up to 10% or more of all of the total of the uh, uh, tuberculosis isolates. It can be spread, uh, as we said before, to humans, and it can be spread to cattle as well. So this is Mycobacterium caprae. One more disease of the hematolymphatic system that uh, is well known in goats, especially the dairy goat breeds, are tumors of the thymus. Okay, These are uh, thymomas. They are epithelial tumors. The epithelium of the uh, thymus is the neoplastic form. Now they have been graded out over the years, so you have lymphocyte-rich thymomas, lymphocyte-poor thymomas. They basically all have the same progress and prognosis. Now one thing that you will notice uh, in this thymoma from a goat is that it it's very encapsulated. It's still the uh, typical cystic uh, tumor that you see in other species, which can be very difficult to aspirate uh, for cytology because there are a lot of areas of, of cystic degeneration and necrosis, and you can stick this a lot of times and come back with nothing but blood, and I, I've done that myself before. Um, in most species, especially the dog, which is the one I'm, I am the most familiar with, I even had a dog that died of a Thymoma. They don't tend to be encapsulated like this. They tend to be much more space occupying within the uh, uh, abdomen and eventually will get into every little nook and cranny and will uh, uh, just take up any available space. In goats, um, they tend to be more prevalent in older animals and they have a round to oval uh, shape because they are encapsulated. 
in some studies of dairy goats that slaughter up to 25% of the animals had this particular neoplasm. So when you think about, uh, you think about goats, you want to think about thymoma. Thymomas may be associated with uh, perineoplastic syndromes in a number of species, uh, including rabbits where they cause a exfoliative dermatitis, uh, but it doesn't seem to be in the goat. And then one more condition affecting the hematolymphatic system, which appears to be fairly common in goats, is lymphoma. In a 2013 review by Christiane Lohr, uh, of 102 tumors in goats, uh, 17 of those 102 were lymphoma. In a subsequent uh, classification of lymphoma in 2017, Dr. Lohr uh, looked at 15 cases of which 11 were T cell, 4 were B cell, and the T cell uh, tumors tended to involve the mediastinum, the head, and the neck, as you would expect with T cell tumors because the thymus is in that area. So don't forget thymomas and lymphomas can affect the mediastinum of the goat. Okay, and we can talk about the endocrine system, but when we talk about the endocrine system in small ruminants, it is primarily disorders with the thyroid gland and usually affecting uh, very young animals as a congenital finding. The basic mechanism behind uh, enlarged uh, thyroid or goiter in young animals is the fact that uh, inadequate maternal thyroid hormone uh, gets across the placenta. Usually the dam is fine and has no trouble, but uh, the uh, the developing fetus is starved of thyroid hormone. There are a number of things that you can see with animals with congenital hypothyroidism. Um, the thyroid and the adrenal glands are both heavily involved in the uh, parturition process uh, and, and are both involved in initiating it. So animals with uh, fetuses with hypothyroidism uh, may undergo prolonged gestation, and as a result of that, uh, dystocia or retained placenta. Um, many of these animals just have a very large thyroid, but they might also suffer other external problems such as hypotrichosis, as we see here, or uh, uh, joint laxity. And histologically, this uh, skin generally has a lot of ground substance in it, so that's a, a, a called myxedema. It's very common for lambs and, and goat fetuses who are hypothyroid to have this very enlarged goiter, much more so than uh, other species, calves to a certain extent, foals not so much. Um, they may not even show external signs of uh, thyroid hormone deficiency, and these can get really huge. Um, and then when you open them up, they're often sort of cystic and bubbly with uh, uh, really enlarged follicles with minimal or ineffective goiter. Um, and I suppose that something this big would probably contribute to uh, uh, the dystocia as well. We said that the, the overall uh, problem is that not enough maternal thyroid hormone gets to the uh, to the young animal, and usually that is a result of dietary abnormalities with uh, uh, with the dam. There are a number of plants which can cause congenital hypothyroidism. Um, usually, it's the result of ruminal degradation of cyanogenetic compounds in substances such as white clover or linseed meal or various members of the brassicacea family like rape and kale. This, these inhibit the, uh, io, uh, the iodinization of thyroid hormone. I think that the brassica rape and kale and, and, 
and all like that um, will affect a number of species. There have been uh, there have been cases in pet birds that were fed a lot of these leafy greens and developed hypothyroidism. Um, there are also some drugs not commonly used, obviously in small ruminants like thiouracil or, or sulfonamides, but uh, but that can also um, result in the generation of thiocyanates and decrease iodinization of thyroid hormone. Uh, excessive levels of, uh, of iodine can do it as well, maybe too low or too high, and this can be induced by feeding some, uh, some type of plants like seaweed, which has a lot of organic iodine already incorporated within it. And I love those little packages of salted seaweeds. I probably get more iodine than I need. Um, there are a couple of genetic defects which predispose um, in, uh, to goiter in young animals in a number of breeds like uh, Corydales or Merino sheep as well. And I do believe that that brings us to the end of this uh, thankfully very short lecture. So we're going to come back. Our next lecture is going to be considerably longer. We're going to talk about the uh, gastrointestinal tract of sheep and goats. I want you to remember when I think of the, the gastrointestinal tract, the problems start up high. Uh, sheep and goats, because of the way they eat and what they eat and their big nibblers, they tend to wear their teeth out. And, and teeth is a real problem uh, in sheep. And you'd be surprised that uh, animals that are as young as four years of age are their teeth are totally gone, and and with that goes the uh, goes the animal. So with that, uh, that little preview, I will wish you good health, a wonderful day, and I hope that you are being safe out there. And I certainly hope that you're going to come back and look at some more of these videos, either on the Ask JPC website or on the Foundation's YouTube channel. Thank you, and I'll see you again.